Also, uh, now uh, I'm very honored to uh, invite uh, the President of uh, the Italian Chamber of Deputies, Laura Boldrini, to come to the podium. So, and thank you for this session. Lasciatemi dire che questa sala è di una bellezza che stordisce. Io parlerò in inglese perché mi hanno detto che si poteva parlare solo in inglese e in francese e dunque, e dunque ho preparato qualcosa in inglese. Madam Commissioner, authorities, ladies and gentlemen, as I speak, Rescue workers and volunteers are busy digging through the rubble in Dhaka, searching for the bodies and for those still missing after the factory they were working in collapsed just over two weeks ago. The hundreds of workers who were in the building at the time, over 900 of whom have lost their lives, and the many millions like them in Bangladesh and elsewhere worked long hours in dangerous conditions for the equivalent of a few dozens of euro a month. Today, eight more workers died in Dhaka after a fire workout in the factory they worked in. Bangladesh must, of course, do more to ensure adequate working conditions and better wages. But the primary responsibility for what happened in Dhaka and, if, and for the countless other such incidents in sweet shops around the world lies with us. The Rana Plaza workers produce garments for Western firms many of which were European. They slave labor, as Pope Francis has so aptly described it, was and is the result of Western and European companies' unlimited quest of profits. It was also the result of a tendency on the part of private enterprises worldwide to flee from countries where labor laws and government enforcement protect workers. And our governments have so far been unable to limit this tendency or have responded to it by dismantling safeguards for workers in their own countries. Are we, is Europe abandoning its role at the front forefront of the global battle for rights. The European Union has signaled that in, it may consider trade actions against Bangladesh, limiting or eliminating the preferential access to the EU market, markets for its garments. This is a step in the right direction, but does little to address the root causes of the problem. Some of the firms whose clothes were produced in the Rana Plaza factory have stepped forward to offer compensation to the victims and their families. To ensure public awareness and a culture of responsibility, public opinion needs to be well informed. This is the part played by the robust, independent, and pluralistic media we need to foster. The companies which have taken these steps were responsive to affected media coverage at home. Too few major European sports, including in Italy, have signed up the international initiative geared at insurance fair working conditions worldwide. For decades, 
Europe drove the process which led to the consolidation of fundamental rights in international law. We led the battle worldwide to ensure the rights be recognized, not granted. We put the right to work in our constitutions, establishing the social Europe on which the European project is funded. We moved to enforce what one of Italy's most well-known theorists on the subject, Stefano Rodota, has called the right to have rights. And Europe, the European project, was a powerful magnet attracting other countries which were lured by the idea of a space of freedom, common values, and shared prosperity. Is the European project still so appealing? Yes, the EU has integrating human rights into its foreign policy. Yes, the EU is leading the global battle for a moratorium on the death penalty. Yes, the Union now has a fundamental rights agency. Yes, the EU is a model for state elsewhere in the world, in East and West Africa, for instance, which wish to create areas where people and goods can circulate freely. And yes, as Mr. Bonino mentioned this morning, the possibility to accession to the European Union can still contribute to getting old enemies to sit around the same table and to strike deals which would not have been possible a few years ago, as the recent agreement between Serbia and Kosovo shows. In other ways, however, Europe has chosen to abandon its leading role in the protection of fundamental rights. Efforts to secure Europe's borders have led some member states, including my own, to fail to respect international law by sending refugees back to countries where they were at risk of torture or inhuman or degrading treatment, or where they could have been returned to the states where they faced persecution. On some occasions, member states have signed readmission agreements with third countries which have not been subjected to parliamentary ratification and scrutiny, and when human rights clauses are either inexistent or weak. For too long, our attention towards the southern shores of the Mediterranean our common sea, the Mare Nostrum, has focused almost exclusively on migration control, despite our knowledge as European that mobility helps drive growth. And now, in the wake of the Arab Spring, Europe could and should play a greater role in supporting and strengthening the new democracies in the region across Europe, and particularly in countries which have traditionally been strongly pro-European, anti-European feelings are growing. A poll published yesterday by an Italian daily shows that for the first time, for the first time, a majority of Italians, 53%, now view EU membership in negative terms. As Europe becomes synonymous with austerity, as the recession deepens across most of the continent, unemployment spirals and families struggle to pay their bills, nationalist, narrow-minded se sentiments are replacing the ideals Europe's funding father fought for. Solidarity, solidarity. One of the founding principles of the European project is being replaced by petty, vengeful attitudes which divide Europe instead of uniting it. 
members who are, la who are allegedly easy spenders against tidy bookkeepers. Extremist forces whose statements and action often have explicit, explicit neo-Nazi overtones are now represented in a number of national parliaments. Rustic gangs are active on the streets of some European countries, harassing and attacking migrants and refugees. Freedom of speech and the freedom of the media are being restricted in other parts of Europe. How can we recognize Europe with its citizens? How can we ensure that Europe regains its rightful place as a model for the rest of the world? I believe we need to return to and support the values and principles on which Europe was founded. We need to reinforce, not undermine, the European social model with its emphasis on protecting, not abandoning, those in need and on safeguarding workers' rights. Southern Europe, my country, Italy, as well as Greece, Spain and Portugal, needs more, needs more, not less welfare to counter the effects of the crisis and to enable people to get back on their feet and forge a better future for themselves, for their countries, and for Europe as a whole. We need more, not less, solidarity between and within states and more solidarity between generations. We need labor reforms which combat job insecurity rather than contributing to generating it. We need to access to effect of austerity measures and listen to those calling for changes in policy before it is too late. If we do not, if we do not take these steps, Europe's social cohesion is at risk, and our youth may come to be known in the future as Europe's lost generation. We need to involve parliaments, national parliaments, and the European Parliament more in the European decision-making process, ensuring that economic and monetary policies approved in Brussels as discussed by elected representative. Article 13 of the Fiscal Compact is the first step in this direction, but more and more needs to be done. We need to strengthen institutions in member states. The processes and the deliberations of elected institutions like parliaments must become more transparent. And we must ensure the independent bodies tasked with monitoring and upholding human rights exist in all EU countries. Some say that uh, straightening rights is not a priority when times are hard. I believe that the opposite, the opposite holds true, that more rights, as Amartya Sen has so forcefully argued, lead to a greater sense of participation in political processes and, as the history of Europe over the last decades has demonstrated, to greater, greater prosperity. We need to ensure that EU members, which violate uh, fundamental rights or which undermine the values Europe has codified in the Treaty of European Union, face speedy, strong action, just like states whose budget deficits are not in line with provisions in the Maastricht Treaty are systematically subjected to procedures which aim to ensure their respect for those provisions. We need the European Union to subject its members and not just the accession 
or candidate countries to the same scrutiny as regards respect for fundamental rights and freedom, which it reserves for countries' economic and financial performance indexes. We have the tool for this, Article 7 of the Treaty on European Union. We only need to ensure that we use these tools to defend those fundamental rights and the European project as a whole. 2013 is the European Year of Citizens. Let us assure, let us assure that Europe's citizens all have equal access to the rights they possess, that public opinion is influenced by facts, not fiction, and that it is able to mobilize to demand respect for those rights in Europe and elsewhere. Shortly before he died, my fellow countryman, the great multilingual novelist Antonio Tabucchi, wrote about this, quote, strange European Union where bookkeeping takes precedence over human rights. Unquote. I hope that his prophecy never comes true. Authorities, ladies and gentlemen, we need more, not less rights. We need more, not less Europe. Thank you.